You are listening to the Shepherd's Tent Message of the Week. We hope you enjoy this teaching from the family. We just like prophesy that there's sounds for this house. Like what I love is there's spaces where it's absolutely just okay to be you. And like what's awesome is, is um, this is like the, the downside of it. If someone comes in and does something different than you're used to and you're like, yeah, let's do that. Isn't that like what everybody, it's like a certain preacher or a certain thing. You're like, yeah, yeah, do that. Let's do that. That's cool. Let's do that. Instead of going, that's amazing. They found who they are. I wonder what's in me. Like, so we just end up with all these copycats everywhere. Like everyone's trying to look like each other and sound like each other and be like each other. And then we turn them into like record labels and, (laughs) and denominations As long as we all sound and look alike, then we're totally okay. We're totally safe. Safety is not found when we all look the same and sound the same, just so we're clear. Like, that's the opposite of safety, right? Like, if history has taught us anything, (laughs) right? That's not the way it works. When a bunch of people sound alike and look alike, try to come together to defend what they sound and they look like, then we're always in a position of somebody has to be on the defense and somebody has to be on the offense instead of all of us just being connected and together as one family. See, that's what's supposed to make us different than the rest of the world. That's actually what's supposed to make us different is we're actually supposed to be together in all things with all of our differences in the same space. That's what makes something beautiful is diversity, complexity, nuance, frustration, tension. That's what makes something stunning. That's the difference between something that looks cool and something that is life-changing. Now, you may be cool, but the truth is fads change. So the moment the fad changes, now you're not cool anymore, and you based your whole life on a fad instead of the rock of eternity. Instead of who you were actually made to be and created to be. Who God actually designed you to be. And I think, and this is my take on it. I was feeling this during worship. I was like, God, I've never said this before, but I feel like, I really do feel like God's going to raise up another round of of Christian mystics. He's going to offend everyone by raising up, like, I literally think the word magic is going to come back to the church, which is terrible. And I know everyone's scared of that word, but I love something when it's magical. I like when it's magical. When it's, when it's just, I feel like the word magic just keeps showing up. Even while I was leading tonight, I was like, oh, like these are the, these are the, the new desert fathers are coming back and you guys are a part of it. That's why you're starting in a cave in an upper room because it, everything that's great in Christian history has to start in a cave. And like we want to yell at the, the like we want to yell at the Catholic Church and everyone's all weirded out by it. I, just so we're clear, so I can completely be totally offensive. Like that's we go to mass in the mornings at my house. Like my wife loves going to mass. We love taking the body and the blood, and we love being at the Catholic Church because like there's no pretense. You know what I mean? I kind of like it. I kind of like to go there and nobody's cool. You know what I mean? And I'm like at the end of the day, what I'm trying to say is I feel like we've done a disservice by discrediting them when yet they're the ones. I love this old story. I heard this old story where they had the, they, they, you know, every, all the, the sort of raising up of the Protestants were so mad at the Catholic church because they had the Bible literally chained to the pulpit. It was chained in a box behind a cage. And the Protestants were like, what the heck? You know, like all mad and angry and frustrated. But do you know why it was chained to the pulpit? Because people were trying to take it and burn it. So they said, nobody's getting to it unless they know how holy this thing is. And what looks offensive to you was protective in another generation so you could stand on their shoulders and not repeat it. And then what we've done for the last 40 years is just repeat, 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 repeat. And now we're the ones chained to the pulpit. Because we don't have any dads. I love you moms. You heard me mention this last time. I love, I love it. But we don't have any dads. And really to be a dad, you just have to take responsibility. That's like, can we just like bare bones, you want to be a good dad, show up, take responsibility. It really is that easy. If you show up and you're present and you take responsibility for your good, your bad, and your ugly, dude, you're an amazing dad. 
That's the definition of an amazing father. He shows up and he takes responsibility. Even when it isn't his responsibility. That's what defines a good dad and just some dude who's living in the house. <laughs> oh, well, that's not my job. Oh, I'm sorry. Were you born with certain biological body parts? Then it is your job. Were you born in a masculine body? Yes, then it is your job. It is your responsibility. And to make it even more offensive, like there's, listen, and this is, so would, I just try to get as offensive as possible. Whenever I'm here, I don't know why. It's totally your fault. I'm sorry. I like get here and I'm like, I want to throw something, you know? Like, I'm like, it just feels like the ground like here is like, well, let's just take it as far as we can. You know, like, it's just like as far as you can. And this is, and this is the, this is the lie that's, um, oh God, no, no, I'm not going to go there. Okay. So we're going to. It, this is what I, let me say it this way, because in tenderness, I'm processing something. So I'm going to process it out loud with you. There actually, the, the lie that's been perpetuated that has separated men from women and, and destroyed and devastated traditional marriage is this lie, that there is inequality in traditional ways of doing things because there, that there is such a thing as equality at all. Do you know equality actually isn't a biblical term? It's a, it's a political one. Equality is a term by which the politicians use to divide cultures and to divide people so that they can control and manipulate the masses to be able to get them to do what they want in the largest and easiest way possible. Because what the Bible calls us to do is justice. Let me give you one example. The poor you will have with you always. Who said that? Jesus, right. So there's always going to be people with and without, okay? There's always gonna be people on both sides of that line. The problem is, you're not supposed to use those lines as power over another person. Justice is when I use mine to fill in your lack so that we can do relationship, connection, and intimacy, not lording over. Does that make different? Does that make sense? Because if like, like here's you, what happens is justice is me making my life a resource to everyone God puts in front of me. That's justice. But the problem is, just this is like how offensive it gets. Like, I'm sorry, ladies, you're never going to be able to, there's not going to be a woman who can run as fast as a man. Now, let me, I'm going to tell you why. Because God designed men with a heart that beats two times stronger and they sweat more. Why? Because they need more oxygenated blood because they were biologically and creatively designed so that they could do hard work that women wouldn't have to do so that they could be providers and protectors inside the home so that they could work and sweat and do more for longer hours and suffer more for longer hours to be able to do the work necessary to be protectors and providers and preparers of the home. And when we said, that's not a good enough job, I want your job too, then we dishonor both the man and the woman. The marriage falls apart because the woman who is traditionally more empathetic is now the one that's in competition with the man and the man is in competition with the woman. And that goes against everything Ephesians 5 says. Because Ephesians 5 doesn't begin with wives submit to your husbands. The verse right before that says, you both need to learn to submit to one another. And if you don't get that right, forget everything else. I like to look at it in terms of a dance. Like, I don't know about you guys, like, my wife, like, loves having music on in the background of her entire life. She, like, wants a soundtrack, okay? So we have all those little Siri pods, like little AirPods, all over the house, you know? So the government is fully listening to me at all times, okay? But, like, they, they're all over the house. So I just say, you know, Siri, play this, you know? My wife, like, Siri, play this. And every once in a while, my daughter will be in her room because she has a pod, and she'll be like, Siri, play Taylor Swift. And that's pretty much all that happens in my house. So it's like, but the point is, guess what? There's music inside my home at all times, at all times. The problem is each room has its own pod and has each person has control over their pod. Now, here's what the crazy part is. Inside my house, there's music. There could be 12 different kinds of music. All in my house, we're not all clashing with each other, different rooms. Guess what? If it's raining outside, guess what's happening in the house? Music. If it's sunny outside and really, really hot, guess what's happening inside? Music. If it's like completely blither, like it's just blizzarding outside, whatever's happening outside, whatever season it is, there's still music on the inside. 
The problem is because we don't know what music each one is listening to, it's very difficult to dance together. So what happens in relationship is if your spouse is listening to heavy metal and you're listening to jazz, you go up to try to pull them close and they pull you into a mosh pit and smash your face off. And you're like, whoa, 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 what just happened? You're so angry. Well, no, actually I was just in a different mindset. It has nothing to do with the season going on outside the house, the season that's happening in our world. What's happening is I need to learn to listen to the music my spouse is listening to so I can learn to dance the dance they're dancing. I get to, I get to, I have the privilege in my world to pull my wife close and for us to learn to dance together because it is never too late to learn to dance together. No matter how broken your story is, no matter how bashed up and how much you've hurt each other or been hurt prior, you actually can still learn to dance together. Because that's really the goal, right? Because you have to lean into each other. We always, like my wife and I always say, it's the, the best part about being married is I have someone to lean into. And when you're doing this well, you can start to dance together. And most of us aren't learning how to dance together. We're trying to fix one another. That's way different than dancing. Right? Trying to fix my spouse is way different than me trying to dance with my spouse. But nobody's teaching us how to dance. Those are the tools we need. And I think it's because we just don't honor each other in the house. We don't know how to honor each other anymore. And the specific roles we each play. Like there are certain things that, like just on the other side, you guys are like, oh, I'm so, like anybody that thought, oh, well, thanks, Jake. A woman's not going to be able to run as fast as a man or do those hard things. Okay, thanks, dude. Oh, well, I'll, let me give you the other side of it. Women, your brain develops for education a full year in advance to men. So did you know that during the women's liberation movement, so women's liberation movement, during the women's liberation movement, there was a 13% gap of men over women in education. Did you know that? Okay, now you do, 13%. Now, 40 years later, or like 60 years later, guess what we have now? Dude, that's some warfare. Whatever is happening in there, it's awesome. Can you hear it? It's all, who is it? Use? Oh, sorry. Sorry, I was like, yeah! Wait, okay, um, are they, can they hear us? Is that our, is that? Oh, they are. Okay, I was going to say on the count of three, we all yell, because that would be fun. Oh, yeah, me too. Um, okay, jumping back in. Now, women, now look at this. Women, during the women's liberation movement, were fighting to be able to have a place in education, correct? So 13%, the reason they were so outraged is it was a 13% difference, women to men, in education. So men outranked, men, men way outranked women. Now, if you, go, if you look at it today, it's 15% in the opposite direction. Women over men in the education system, 15% women outnumber men in education. And no one says a thing. No one says anything. Why? Because, again, we're just going to keep getting more and more offensive, is the fact that at the end of the day, moms and government don't want people to have adversity or suffering. And guess what you need to make a man? Adversity and suffering. So when, so, <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. This just gets weird. It just gets worse and worse. I apologize. But the point is, is that we have to pay attention to the fact that we have different roles and the way we develop one another is completely different than the way that's being set up for us right now. And I'll say it this way. We'll go back to Genesis 1, which I might've said last time. But in Genesis 1, Eve eats from the tree and did they realize that they were naked? When Eve eats from the tree, did they realize they were naked? No. When Adam eats from the tree, do they realize they're naked? Why? Because it was Adam's responsibility to care for the garden, not Eve's. So 
So when we keep trying to make the responsibility the woman's responsibility, it's actually not hers to carry. And it's why culture can run away the way it runs away because men are supposed to take responsibility for what God gave them in the positions that God gave them. That is your job, men, and we are avoiding suffering. We're avoiding pain. We're avoiding hardship and then calling it, praise God, thank you, Jesus. It's been so blessed. You only get formed into men when you actually have time under tension, when it actually hurts for long periods of time and you don't move, you grow under the weight of it. In fact, I want to give you a new term tonight. It's called anti-fragility. Anybody ever heard that term before? It's an amazing new, it's a, it's a philosophical term and it's been written in this book by, uh, what's his name, Nadeem, uh, I, can't, I don't want to botch his name. But anti-fragility is this, okay? So fragile is like a wine glass, okay? Like a wine glass. I topple it over, it's got wine in it, topple it over, it smashes and the wine goes everywhere, right? That's fragile, right? No good comes from it. Okay, now on the other side, we have resilience. Everybody loves, we want to be resilient. That's a good word, okay? Resilience is a plastic cup. I push it over, the liquid spills everywhere, but the cup doesn't break. I can use it again if I wanted to, correct? That's resilience. Now, anti-fragility. Anti-fragility is if you could smash the cup and then the cup came back twice as large. And you're like, well, nothing, in, nothing works like that in, in nature, wrong. When you work out and you actually get a good workout, you're literally tearing your muscles. And when you tear your muscles in a repeated way, in a healthy way consistently, what do you get? Bigger muscles. Okay, if I was to place you inside of a sterile bubble and you never got exposed to sickness and you never got exposed to any disease, then I take you out and put you in the world, guess what you're gonna do? Die. Die. Because your immune system, your immune system was made to fight disease and get stronger when it faces disease. We know this, right? This is basic science. That is called anti-fragility. And we need to raise up men who aren't just resilient, they're actually anti-fragile. They actually know how to grow stronger from their pain. You know who else did that? Jesus Christ. Dude, that dude dies on a cross, resurrects three days later, now that dude's walking through walls. Let's talk about that. You get what I'm saying? That's like human being 2.0. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about there's an increase after resurrection, which means, by the way, we've been preaching a false gospel. You know what the false gospel is? Come and live so that you never have to die. That's a false gospel. The real gospel is come and die so that you can live. Do you see the difference? Come and live, come and live, come and live, come and live. Don't worry, you never have to die. Who's gonna say no to that? Of course, when we preach that, masses run forward. When we preach a real gospel that says, come and die that you might live, he's really referring to his own experience. He's not asking you to do something he wouldn't do. He literally is asking you, be a man, men, be a man like I'm a man. Do it the way I do it. Come and die so that you become a resource to others in every area of your life. We avoid pain and suffering and death in every way we can. But we are supposed to be messengers of hope, correct? We're supposed to not, do you know the difference between hope and expectations? Expectations are awful, okay? First of all, expectations are terrible, okay? Why? Because they always lead to disappointment. Yeah, see, there you go. So I'm always, I'm having an expectation of my wife. I have an expectation of this. I have an expectation of this. Guess what? You just disappoint it, Okay? Because an expectation is this. An expectation says, my joy, I find my joy when things work out the way I planned. That's an expectation. You wanna know what hope is? Hope is, no, you don't wanna know. It's not, people are like, I don't wanna know. Can we just stay in the other one? Hope is this. I have joy in every circumstance because my plans are connected to something bigger than myself. And that's why 
in Romans 5, it says, can, it, it tells us, therefore, <laughs> I rejoice in my suffering because suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not what? Disappoint. It's the opposite of expectation. See, the weight that you're under in your life that's begging you to go, it, to begging you to die to yourself. It's begging you to die to yourself, to your capacities, the way you think you should do it. We're to die to it. Not, not try to pretend it's not there. That's delusion. That's not faith. And men, we get the privilege to be able to go first. That is some wild stuff. My friend, my friend, Mark is pretty upset. Yeah. So I'll end with saying that, that there is an opportunity for us to grow, but it's not the way we thought. It's not the way we thought, guys. We actually, those things that are really hard, I love this phrase, we got to go down into the wound. Because God didn't save you from your story. He saved you from your sin. So he saved you from the ramifications of what happened to you when you were eight, but he doesn't deliver you from the eight-year-old version of you because that still made you who you are today. It's a really big deal because he really loves that eight-year-old. <laughs> that little version of you that's still wrapped up in your story, like he loves that, that age that you were at. And if he's yesterday, today, and forever, guess what? He's still in the yesterday. And this is what, I, this is, and again, this is my, like, triggers, is really, I'm like, no, don't go back there and go, where is Jesus? That's kind of useless, because if he is everywhere, how hard is that to find? Really, what I want to ask, go back there and see where you are. Where are you in the room? Are you in your body? Are you out of your body? Where are you in that dream, in that, in that memory? Where are you at? I know God's there. That's not a question, right? We know that. We know he's in the, he's there. And he uses all things to the good, which is nice, but where are you? And what did you learn in that moment that you're still walking out today because of your experience? And most men, when we do this work, like you guys know my two, fa my, my two least favorite phrases that come from men are these two phrases. Number one, I'm fine. And number two, it's no big deal. When we start doing this work with men, that's a way of covering and coping with the real pain that's in there that's still hurting them today that they don't want to deal with. And if we're ever going to die to ourselves to become anti-fragile, to become what we are supposed to become, we have to deal with those things. We have to go deal with it. And the reason I keep picking on men like I do every time I go anywhere at this point is because what we're trying to do is go, men, like you have to go first. You have to go first. And, you know, we have a few single ladies in this house of different ages, so I'll say this. There are 13 million more women in the church today than there are men, number one. The average church, they did a study, the average church, just by the numbers, the average church is 80 people. In a church of 80 people, there are 11 single people under the age of 50 who have not been married before. Out of those 11, seven are women. Because we have done a terrible job of raising up Christian men. That's our fault, guys. We have to step up and start raising up men because we have this responsibility to be able to care for society, care for culture. We're the government, not them. We're the greatest government on earth. I'm not afraid of their decision making. I'm raising up kings and queens. I'm raising up sons and daughters. I'm not stressed out about that. I'm not worried about a bank closing. This is not stuff I'm, I'm, I'm and the stuff that's in culture that we, that we're like, ah, oh, we hate this. Like that whole, it's like so, I, I get so confused by Christians most of the time. I just am like so, I'm stunned. <laughs> It's like we're all yelling at Sam Smith because of how demonized he, what he did was. And we're like, what, did you want an, an unsaved person to act like Christ? Was that your expectation? <laughs> like, I'm so confused. Like, why are we? You're just giving him more attention. 
well, this was demonic and satanic. And um, Yeah, he doesn't know Jesus. Like, why is that confusing? It's so confusing to, to Christians sometimes when, when people who don't know Christ act in ways that are unchristlike. I don't know why that's confusing. But then we also double down because are we the conscience of, are we the conscience of culture? Are we the spirit-led center of culture? Yes, we are. We are supposed to demonstrate what culture should live out. So when there's gender confusion outside of these walls, it means it started in here. And because we don't know the roles of men and women in our own homes, it's perpetuated out into our own culture. And of course it plays out twice as distorted. Why? Because we're not setting any standards in here. We're not honoring men and women the way that they should be honored, respected the way that they should be respected, cared for in the way that they should be cared for. We're confused in here and it's doubling down out there because we're not showing up to the party. We're busy criticizing the culture. You're not supposed to be a critic of a culture. You're supposed to be the heart of a culture. Give them something to live up to. Let them, dude, this guy this morning, I go to the coffee shop. I'm like in Jacksonville. I'm, you know, I'm just picking a random coffee shop. Nothing is random. That's for darn sure. I've known, done this long enough. To, nothing's random. And I'm sitting there. Long story short, the guy goes, oh, that's crazy. Like, uh, do you know coffee? Because I was starting a co coffee conversation with him. Just natural where it come from. Blah, blah, blah. And being dorky. And um, the dude goes, oh, are you in coffee? I'm like, oh, no, actually, I, I preach. We do stuff. Uh, I said, actually, I do stuff for for men and for marriages, and um, I do music as well. So I'm kind of doing stuff and traveling through right now. And he's like, oh, that's crazy. I used to be a pastor. Have you ever heard of blah, blah, blah? He starts talking to me. And I was like, oh, it's so interesting. I was like, hey, can, hold on a second. You used to be. Like, so what happened? He's like, oh, Christians. That was his response. I was like, oh, that makes sense. Yeah, cool. Okay, let's go. Keep going. Like, tell me more, you know? I'm like, that's awesome. Tell me more. You know, like, I feel like that sometimes too. So please, I'd love to know. Please talk me out of my own faith. I would love this. Let's go. Let's see where we get. If your faith can be shaken, by the way, by other Christians, I don't know if you ever had it because that's like, come on, you know, that's like you, that's like you being married like for 20 years and you look at a woman and you decide to run off. Well, you know, were you ever really committed in the first place? Like how much work did you put in before that? Sorry, that's a little condemning, but I'm like, come on, like really, if you can be distracted that easily, were you ever really committed? So this guy, we end up in a half an hour conversation. I thought I was going to be late tonight. It's why I didn't make it as at 4.30 because I was there for a half an hour. And we end up in this conversation about he basically reads a Richard Rohr book. And he reads, and I've read the book. So he reads the book uh, Universal Christ by Richard Rohr, which I, I'm not saying everybody should read it. I got a lot out of it. I thought there was cool stuff. Not one time did he ever come across to me in the book as universalist. What he was saying is that pretty much anything can lead you to this man, Jesus Christ. The guy's a Catholic priest. Like he's, this is, the road, right? And so what I'm saying is, is I'm going to him and I'm going, hey man, I don't think that's what the book said because I've read it and here's what I'd like to challenge you on. Do I, is, are you a universalist or are you, or is, or are you, can you find Christ in all things? Because to me, anybody who found another religion just stopped too soon. That to me, that's how simple it is, right? There, every one of those things like, yeah, dude, I would love to be really kind and I think we should be kind and nice and I think we should meditate. I think we should absolutely see God in the plants and the trees and stuff. I think those are all, you just stop too soon. You're like, I'm on the path to God. Well, this is a much easier spot. That's a long road. I'm just going to stay here and we'll name it a new faith. And that's fine. But, but honestly, I told him, I was like, dude, I think you missed it. You just stopped too soon. Like, what if we just kept walking? And now he's already hit me up on Instagram a few times. Why? Because he's just looking for somebody who's not like, and brother, you're wrong. The Bible says. No, what he's looking for is, hey, I think you're dumb. Aw, you're cute. I love that. Guys want this all the time. They're all, my little son is like this. He wants to pick, people get all upset because I'm like, no, no, I like want my son to get like, like punched. I just think it's really good for him. And you're like, you're a terrible father. I'm like, no, 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 no. If you're going to step up like a man and talk trash, there's something really healthy about a man who's like, rah, 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 and then someone goes, wow. You're like, whoa, 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 whoa. I think I took it too far. 
And I'll tell you what, it happened to my son. We play airsoft, you know, the little BBs. And I'll never forget this as long as I live. He's always overshooting everyone, <laughs> running through, acting all tough, not calling his hits. Rah, rah, rah. I'm going to shoot you in the back of the head. Just trying to be all boy, like a 20, you know? Me and my buddies are there. He comes up, runs up to me, shoots me. I already shot him, but I'm talking with him. I'm like, hey, man, you can't do that, blah, blah, blah. And he's talking to me. Well, my, he hadn't gotten shot yet. And my buddy comes up behind him and shoots him in the back of the head. I mean, that hurts, just so you're clear. Those things go like 300 feet per second. They're not a joke. Clacks my son in the back of the head, my buddy. And Judah, my son, is like, what the? And he looks back, and he knows it's my friend. He's like, I deserve that. And he just walks off the field. Because, because there's a recognition in men that they want to be pushed back against. And when nobody pushes back against them, of course they're going to run off the rails. It's not toxic to want to push everybody around. What's toxic is when nobody pushes you back so you don't know your limits and you don't know clear boundaries in your own life. So you have to decide who you really are, where you begin and where you end. That's why every man I talk with, all they want to do is for me to tell them, like the testimony of the church I was just at was he was like, it was so helpful the day Jake called me and we were on the phone and I was trying to figure out what we were going to do. And he just looked at me and said, um, you know, I was telling him all the woes in my heart of what was happening in ministry. And I just, I just told him, I looked over the phone and I said, well, I think your problem is, is you're a freaking coward. I think you're a freaking coward. You need to get your crap together and lead your family, but you're acting like a coward. If you want to be a coward, then let your life run into the ground. But you're acting like a coward. So either get up and do what you're called to do or don't call me again. And you're like, that is the worst counseling I've ever heard. He goes, that moment I knew I was being a coward. And it was time to step up. And I think for us, we have to be those people to each other in love, correct? Do I love that guy? Absolutely. But at some point, we have to push on each other to know where our boundaries are, okay? Thank you for listening to the message of the week. If you would like to partner with the podcast or find out more information about The Shepherd's Tent, please visit us at theshepherdstent.com.